Good evening, everybody. My name is Robert Shapiro. I'm a member of the Board of Directors of the Jewish Community Relations Council. And on behalf of the JCRC of Greater Washington, I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening for our virtual door to door uh, conversations. We're pleased that 12 uh, conversations have taken place during the week of Yom HaShoah among hundreds of teens, adults, and Holocaust survivors representing over 20 congregations and organizations uh, throughout the Washington, D.C. region. We're delighted to be able to offer this program again, even though for a second year it has to be virtual. Uh, for decades, the JCRC has had the great honor and responsibility to organize and host our community-wide Yom Shoah commemorations. You, we hope that you are able to join us this past Sunday when Alicia Wazell, son of Ellie Wazell, uh, was able to share his impactful words. Uh, if you missed it, uh, the recording is available on the JCRC website. Uh, thank you to uh, the survivors and thank you to all of us for joining to hear the testimonies and, and affirm that we will carry on their legacies. Uh, particularly in the midst of a global uh, pandemic, it is important uh, that we maintain our obligations to one another and to fill, fulfill our responsibility to remember. I'd also like to thank Sarah Winkleman, uh, Janice Rosenblatt, uh, JCRC uh, staff who uh, did a lot of work helping to coordinate these conversations. I uh, also want to thank all of the uh, Jewish uh, congregational edu educators whose partnership really made this possible. And of course, we want to thank uh, Peter for joining us uh, uh, to speak with us today. Uh, and I'm honored to be able to uh, introduce Peter. And, and all of us are honored uh, that uh, Peter Gurig is here to share his Holocaust experiences and how he survived in hiding with his mother and extended family. After the war, Peter participated in the design of the first Hungarian-made computer. He defected to the United States in 1980. Uh, Peter, I'll turn it over to you. And again, thank you for sharing with us. Thank you, Robert. Uh, the honor is mine to be here. Uh, good evening, everybody. And um, I want to introduce uh, a little bit, uh, not with my family story, but uh, with a little bit of statistics, namely that why it is so important for us uh, survivors of the Holocaust to meet personally, unfortunately, right now virtually with um, every one of you, especially with uh, young people. A survey in 2018 um, uh, investigated uh, or polled uh, the millennials uh, about their knowledge of the Holocaust, and the numbers were shocking. Uh, two thirds of the millennials do not know what Auschwitz was and is. Four in 10 millennials don't know that 6 million Jews were killed in the Holocaust. These numbers are really numbing. And I hope that uh, by this presentation and uh, with my colleagues at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, we will be able to reach out to as many people as possible, especially uh, young people. So the memory of the 6 million will be not only preserved, but the lessons of the Holocaust will be not only taught, but also understood. And hopefully um, it would lead to a, a more peaceful world. Um, I am a child survivor of the Holocaust. I was born in 1941 in Budapest, Hungary. It wasn't a good place and a good time. Um, to be born in a Jewish family. On my mother's side, I came uh, from a very Orthodox family. I, my great grandfather was a rabbi in a small town, what is uh, Slovakia today. My grandfather studied in yeshiva, but um, he never made to be a rabbi. He had a big family. 
uh, with nine children and the rabbi's salary couldn't support it. So he went into, if I remember correctly, barrel making for uh, winemakers. On my father's side, I came from uh, not an assimilated Jewish uh, family, uh, what you would call conservative in American terms. And um, the family legacy, unfortunately, uh, especially from my father's side, was not handed down because um, from my father's side, nobody survived the Holocaust. 1941, March 10, when I was born, um, the war was already underway and my father was already taken six months before my birth to the so-called um, forced labor battalions. Peter, do you want to show the slides? I'm sorry, I wasn't oh, sure. Sorry, yeah, if you could share your screen, yeah. we could illustrate some of the things I am uh, telling you. Meantime, I'm telling you as a child uh -oh, survivor. Wait, hold on. That didn't... Are you seeing the screen or are you seeing my- Yeah, screen? I am seeing. You're seeing the door of the door. Yes. So okay. you can proceed. Uh, we can skip the map. Uh, I assume everybody knows where Hungary is. And um, this is my parents' wedding uh, photo. They uh, met in the early 1930s. They got married in 19. 37. My father was an um, office manager in a publishing house in Budapest, interestingly named after Benjamin, Benjamin Franklin. And uh, my mother was a milliner, a female hat maker, which was a very good profession in the 30s. Everybody wore hats and uh, she had a very good uh, business. Our parents uh, lived a very normal uh, middle-class uh, life uh, in Budapest. They had a nice apartment and um, they loved outdoors. They went camping and skiing together uh, with their friends, but um, their life was uh, turned upside down when the war started in 19. 39 and Hungary entered uh, my mom and my father uh, can be seen on the left side of the pictures picture and um, Hungary was not occupied by Nazi Germany the Holocaust history in Hungary it's a little bit different from the rest of Europe however Hungary was one of the staunchest allies of the Nazi Germany, and they entered the war with um, the Germans and Hungarian Jews were not allowed to serve in the Hungarian army because they weren't trusted that they can handle weapons and armory. So they set up the special um, units of forced labor battalions which served uh, with regular military units. And these units uh, consisted of uh, Hungarian Jews, lawyers, doctors, teachers, did all the dirty job for the army. They were the one building bridges and uh, roads and um, did the kitchen duties and everything you can imagine a military camp except they didn't serve as uh, soldiers. When I was born in 1941, my father already served in the unit. Uh, he is marked with this uh, blue arrow. And he saw me only once. And I have no memory except the picture, which were taken when I was three months old and he was uh, let go for a long weekend. And that's the only memory I have of my father. What I tell you tonight is um, 
obviously very little of personal memory before the war and during the war. What I know about our family life is what my mother told me after the war, what I read from my father's uh, postcards he sent uh, from the Fort's Labor Battalion. And this is the last card he sent in 1942, December, just before his unit was shipped to Ukraine to fight against the Soviet Red Army. Uh, what I learned from these postcards and also from my mother's um, diary, I know that they loved each other um, without any doubt. I know that they hoped against hope that although they were separated, they will be reunited. And that's what uh, you can hear if I would be able to read just a couple of uh, sentences from my mother, uh, my father's car and from my mother's diary. The diary is really not meant to be a diary. My mom had a notebook where she kept her customers' personal data, addresses, phone numbers, and the size of their head and whatnot. And in between pages, she wrote down whatever happened to us while my father was away. And her thinking was that um, when my father would come back, at least she would remember the first words I said, the food I liked and the things I didn't like. So it's a good um, uh, place uh, to find what we were doing uh, during the first two years or three years of the Holocaust and also what her thinking was at that time. So here is, uh, uh, or here are a couple of sentences, my father's uh, last postcard in December, 1942. My dearest squirrel, squirrel is a Hungarian term of uh, endearment and my golden little Peter. I got all of your cards and I read them with great pleasure. I ask you to write more often because reading every line is a special blessing for me. Your cards are full of longing for me. And can you imagine how much I long for you and for our cozy home? But for the time being, we have to be very patient. We have to wait steadfastly and trust in the good Lord. And here are uh, a couple of sentences from my mother's diary. Uh, you can see if you read uh, uh, all the pages that she went through an emotional roller coaster from the high of uh, love to the low of desperation to the next high being determined to survive. So she, here is uh, what she wrote. Uh, you, addressing my father, you have no idea how much I long to see you. The thought of seeing you and having you next to me drives me to insanity. Why the good Lord punishes me so much that the one I adore most is separated from me for such a long time. Her determination to survive um, jumps off the pages, really, and I am here today because of her determination. Your little girl, that's how my father uh, addressed her in a couple of the cards. Your little girl is strong. The good Lord listens to my everyday prayers that we will be united soon. I have to remind myself all the time that I should, be not, I should not be bitter in spite of the circumstances that I have to be strong so our survival will be secured. They hoped against hope that they will be reunited. Unfortunately, it did not happen in 1943. 
January, my mother got a notification from the Hungarian Ministry of Defense that my father disappeared uh, during war activities. And that was just a, a, a form where his name was uh, handwritten and every widow or every spouse left behind got the same form with different names. We only know that um, he was in Ukraine and the war in 19, early 1944 in Ukraine was very fierce. The winter was very cold and um, thousands and tens of thousands Hunga Hungarian soldiers and Hungarian Jews in the forced labor battalions died. We know what happened in the labor battalions from those who survived, survived and were able to come back after the war was over because they were captured by the Soviet Red Army and they were taken to POW camps in Siberia. And when they came back, they some of them told their uh, stories. And we do know how many Hungarians in the forced labor battalion. Actually, there were approximately 100,000 Hungarian Jews between the age of um, 18 to 55 served in this labor battalions. And uh, out of the 100,000, uh, 40,000 never came back. And among them was my uh, father. They were the first Hungarian victims of the Holocaust because the deportation of the Hungarian Jews and the mass annihilation of the Hungarian Jews didn't start uh, until 1944 when the German Nazi government didn't trust the Hungarians anymore as allies and um, Germany occupied Hungary in March 19, 1944. Until then, uh, Hungarian Jews were not deported to the labor camps and um, concentration camps and killing camps. However, from April to June, early July, in a matter of um, three months, out of the 800,000 Hungarian Jews, 426,000 were shipped to Auschwitz and Maidanek and Bergen-Belsen and were killed. These were the Jews who lived in the countryside, the Jews among them, us, uh, we lived uh, in Budapest, were relatively safe because of the logistics, uh, the Germans just couldn't ship uh, more than 420,000 Jews in a matter of three months to Poland. This uh, slide I put here to show you that who were the major groups uh, participating in the Holocaust. Of course, there were the perpetrators, the Nazi uh, German soldiers, uh, the SS and the Wehrmacht, you can see on the left side of the picture. There were uh, the victims, um, the Hungarian Jews of Budapest who were uh, uh, herded to either to the Budapest ghetto or to the railway station directly and shipped to Auschwitz. You can see them with the yellow star of David, which was made mandatory in April 1944. And what you can see in the background are the people, the bystanders. There were literal bystanders standing by the roadside, seeing uh, their fellow citizens um, taking away and many of them were smiling. Many of them were passive. Many of them were smiling. 
they were the silent collaborators, the Bicelanders. Without them, the Holocaust couldn't have happened. Couldn't have happened to the extent that six million Jews died, among them, them one and a half million children. We had to leave our apartment uh, because the Hungarian government decided that all the Jews had to move into Budapest ghetto. You can see the inner city of Budapest uh, in the map. The, per, uh, the pinkish uh, area is where the actual ghetto was. That was the traditional Jewish quarter of Budapest around the great synagogue of Budapest, which survived the war, was restored, and it's currently there. Maybe some of you have uh, already visited. And you see those uh, yellow, little yellow star of David. They were the so-called designated houses. Obviously, the Budapest ghetto couldn't contain the more than 200,000 Hungarian Jews. So, Apartment buildings were assigned to Jewish people, uh, apartment buildings from where the original tenants, non-Jews had to move out and the Jews had to move in. And these designated houses were uh, also marked by the yellow star of David. Um, every Jew, were compelled to give up their apartment unless they leave the already designated houses or in the Budapest ghetto and move into these designated houses. My mother was determined to survive and they knew that it was a really bad sign that they tried to collect the Jews in one places and by that time the rumors uh, were uh, not only rumors but they were confirmed that uh, Jews from the countryside were shipped, uh, deported to Poland to the death camps. So we were lucky that my mom had a childhood uh, friend, a Catholic uh, uh, lady, married lady. They didn't have children, but they had a two bedroom apartment in a non designated house, and we moved there. These people risked their very own life because not only the Jews who went into hiding were punished, but also those families who harbored them. Nevertheless, this couple uh, took us in and uh, we were there for no more than three weeks when a so-called good neighbor den denounced us to the Hungarian police and um, the police came and arrested my mother and took her away. I have a personal memory when the Hungarian uh, police came in because they had a very fancy um, uniform. And also I was fascinated by their uh, guns. I didn't know what was happening. Uh, my mom and the host family assured me that my mom uh, will be taken away just for a short time and uh, she will be back next day. She came back two days later. She was uh, one of the very few lucky ones who were able to escape uh, from the arrest from one of the most infamous Hungarian jail. What my mom did was that she had this paper from the Hungarian Ministry of Defense uh, telling her that my father, it was a death certificate uh, practically. And she had that death certificate with her when she was taken away and she showed it to the warden of the jail and claiming that she was a so-called war widows. War widows were only the regular soldiers' widows who died during the war activities. Jewish widows of those uh, people who served in the Hungarian labor battalion, they were not entitled to any privilege as war widows. 
Never I'm sorry to interrupt, but is this the War Widow certificate? I just want to make sure. Uh, no, this will be for the next one. You can leave it uh, oh, uh, okay. here. Um, anyway, uh, the war then either had pity on my mother or he had no idea what that paper was. Nevertheless, they let her go. My mom came back and we had to move because we couldn't risk our life and the host family's life again. What uh, my mom did next was still not moving to the ghetto, still not moving to the designated house, but they, we moved to the so-called um, protected houses. This was uh, a special place in Budapest, Hungary. A Swedish uh, aristocrat, um, Raul Wallenberg, uh, came to Budapest in early 1944. He was sent by the, the American War Refugee Board with some government money, some donated money, and he bought up uh, approximately 32 or 33 apartment buildings in Budapest. And he crammed as many Jews as possible, sometimes four or five families sharing a two or three bedroom apartment. We were safe in that building because this building, according to the international uh, laws, were protected by the Swedish government because according to this law, these uh, buildings belong to Sweden. They were Swedish territory and local government and local police could not enter in these buildings. We were safe there, although our life, you can imagine by this time food was rationed, uh, electricity and water. Sometimes we had them, most of the time we didn't. Budapest was already under attack by the allies, but uh, we still had our life and uh, we lived uh, in this uh, building until October 1944, where uh, the Nazis uh, didn't trust even the far right Hungarian government and they gave over the government to the ultra-nationalist uh, Hungarian Arrow Cross Party. The Hungarian Arrow Cross was just a bunch of thugs, some of them in black uniform, most of them in civilian clothes with a uh, uh, sign of uh, uh, the Arrow Cross. And uh, these people couldn't care about international laws. They came into our buildings, they rounded up everybody. People were taken either to the Budapest ghetto or to the railway station. And unfortunately, many of them, they were taken uh, to the shore of the Danube River or the banks of the Danube River and they were uh, killed there. Uh, people had to undress. They were actually tied together, three, four of them. They were shot, they, their body fell into the ice called Danube River and the water washed away the bodies. On the next slide, I believe you can see uh, the Nazi arrow cross going to their rampage in Budapest, running up uh, Jews. And I believe we have uh, the next slide showing how Budapest looked like in the end of 1944, just uh, before the Soviet Red Army reached Budapest and liberated Budapest. When we left the protected uh, house, uh, we had to move to the Budapest ghetto. We had no other uh, place to go. My grandparents on my mother's side already lived there. My two aunts and my cousin, 
Uh, we lived uh, only just two months in the Budapest ghetto in a one bedroom apartment. It was irrelevant because we spent most of the time in the temporary bowl, uh, bomb shelter, which is was the basement of uh, this building. Uh, this was the place where people stored their fuel for uh, their furnaces. There were no central heating or electric heating. Every apartment had its own either coal, coal fired or wood fired uh, furnaces. And uh, that's uh, where uh, they kept uh, uh, the, the woods and the, the coal. It was dirt floor. That's where we sat while the allied forces were bombing uh, Budapest. By that time, electricity was out, water was practically out. The only food we had was that uh, my mom and my grandmother went out between two bombing grades and they went to the bombed out buildings uh, rummaging for leftover food. And sometimes they came back with um, stale bread uh, or even there was mold in it. We couldn't keep dietary law anymore. We ate whatever they could get. And uh, I remember that uh, one day my uh, grandmother, a very orthodox observant uh, Jew, came back with a big slab of bacon, which is not the bacon you can find in this uh, uh, the, uh, your neighborhood uh, grocery store. It was just pure lard actually, and we ate it. We ate it uh, in spite of the dietary uh, law because every calorie meant that we lived uh, one day longer. We lived uh, through the bombing of uh, Budapest and the liberation of the Budapest ghetto in 1945, January. We were alive. We went back to our apartment. Uh, if you go back to the previous side, I just put it there because this picture was taken just one block away from the apartment house where my parents and I lived uh, before the Holocaust. And you see uh, how much damage the war did. And I have used the word lucky a couple of times already, and I'm using it again because our house was not bombed out. And not only it were not bombed out, but the family who occupied our apartment were gracious enough and let us uh, go back and, and take our apartment back with everything my mom left behind and it meant everything uh, from furniture to linen to uh, uh, silver were everything. And I'm saying we were lucky because most of the people who survived the horror of the Holocaust and went back to a, their apartment and even if the apartment was intact, they couldn't um, reoccupy because the family who lived there they said, sorry, this is our apartment. Uh, you have no proof, it's yours. And they didn't let people back. So people who lost everything, including family, they lost whatever was left because the cruelty of the people who took their belongings. From here on, I believe usually I have an hour, now I have only 30 minutes, so in a nutshell, the rest of the story, uh, the war was over. My father didn't came back. Um, we wanted to immigrate to the United States. I had an aunt and uncle living in Baltimore who were, again, the word lucky. They were lucky enough. They came to the United States in 1938 and 1941, respectively. And uh, they uh, invited us to come and live with them. Unfortunately, a very strict uh, quota system was still in place in the United States. Just a certain number of people 
could come in and unfortunately that uh, led to the fate of many Jewish people who weren't able to come to the United States before the war or during the war because of this um, immigration restrictions. Anyway, this picture was taken out from our passport, our family passport in 1946. We were waiting for our visa in 1949. The Communist Party, with the help of the Soviet Red Army who occupied Hungary, took over the government. They closed the borders. There was no way to leave. I grew up in communist Hungary. That's a completely different story, another story for another time. I was fed up uh, with the communist system by the late 1970s. I uh, went to college. I became an electrical engineer. I had a relatively good job. With my job, I had the very special privilege to go to Western Europe for uh, international conferences. I was able to compare my life in Hungary and the lies and the propaganda of the communist government with the life in the West. 1980, I decided to defect, came to the United States, started a new life and um, the rest is history, I think. I have a last picture of my family taken. Unfortunately, we couldn't get the whole family together in the last four or five years. So this was taken, I think, five years ago. Uh, two of my grandchildren, granddaughters are missing from the pictures. I'm happy father of uh, five girls and uh, four granddaughters and the fifth one is coming next month and she is a granddaughter also or will be a granddaughter and I think uh, that's all I could squeeze into uh, this uh, short time. I worked uh, mostly for NASA the last 40 years until I retired in 2014. That's when I joined uh, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum as a survivor volunteer. I love my job even during the pandemic and um, I'm ready for your questions. Wow, thank you, thank you. You packed a lot into 30 minutes. So I really appreciate you taking the time to speak. I just want to mention, if anybody, we're a small group, so if people want to ask questions, they can. I have a number of questions. Maybe we'll just start with a few of them. Have you had the opportunity to go back to Hungary? Have you met any of the people, like have you ever met up with the Catholic family that you stayed with for a couple months or the Swedish person who's building to stay? Swedish, was he Swedish or was just part of? Uh, Raul Wallenberg. Well, Raul and Raul Wallenberg's story. Oh, it was Raul but, Wallenberg. Oh, I did. Okay. Hopefully, everybody knows it. If you don't, you can look it up at the museum uh, website. That was the Swedish person, my hero, who really saved our our life. Unfortunately, he lost his own life because he was arrested uh, right after. Budapest was liberated, taken to the Soviet Union, and uh, he was never uh, to be found. About my traveling back to Hungary uh, in 1989, I became a U.S. citizen. Uh, communism was, uh, the communist system was about to collapse uh, just a few months later, and so I got a visa at that time you needed a visa to go to Hungary. So I was not arrested because when I defected in absentia, I was uh, uh, sentenced to two years to jail had I returned, which I didn't. And uh, since then, uh, my wife and I, and sometimes uh, my family 
regularly goes back to Hungary. I still have some relatives, uh, cousins and their families and some good um, childhood friends. Wow. Did your mother come defect with you? Or no, she's... my mother, um, uh, she uh, stayed in Hungary. We offered her uh, to come and stay with us. She didn't want to give up her independence. And really that determination to survive and the determination to survive the, during the communist system helped her to reach the nice age of uh, 90. She died at age 90 and actually she was here in the United States uh, visiting us when um, she got pneumonia and she died here. Uh, in the last few years of her life, she visited us regularly every year during the uh, winter, the winters here in Washington are not really for people who are not accustomed to it. And um, she saw some of her uh, grandchildren growing up and um, that's all I can. Did she talk to you about this? I mean, you were obviously very young. So did she, I assume that she talked to you about the stories growing up, like? Well, that's a very good question. I'm really glad you uh, said I didn't have time to tell this part of the Holocaust story. Unfortunately, Holocaust survivors um, did not talk, most of them, about their experience. Uh, um, she not only didn't uh, want to talk about it, she, she didn't tell me about the postcard she had from my father. She didn't tell me about the notebook or the diary she had. I was already living in the United States. I was in my early fifties when she finally opened up. And that was very typical. And unfortunately, we not only lost the 6 million people, but many of the stories um, of the survivors who took their memories um, into the graves because they just didn't live long enough to put the Holocaust behind them and tell their stories. So unfortunately, I didn't learn anything about the Holocaust in the kindergarten or elementary school or any school because Holocaust history was not told and taught in communist Hungary. So I didn't know the whole story until I came to the United States and my mother uh, started to open up and tell the family history. Also, my mother remarried in 1953, and my stepfather was an Auschwitz survivor. And he had the number uh, in his arm. And every time I saw it, or my uh, stepbrother, uh, his, uh, my stepfather's son from his first marriage, we asked him about the number, and he just shrugged his shoulder and, and he never told me, us what it was and what Auschwitz was and what he went through. In very late, actually, the first time I went back in 1989, he died in 1990. He also lived uh, to the age of 90. That's when he opened up and told some, but only very few of his story. That's uh, very unfortunate. And this is uh, why we, the remaining survivors, and I am the, practically the youngest at age 80 in the survivor uh, uh, volunteer group. We try to tell as much as we know because the first hand storytelling is really what uh, matters and what captures people's uh, mind. And hopefully you who hear our stories will be able to 
uh, help your children and grandchildren. Yeah, yeah definitely. I think we will. Is it and I, so so many of the things you told us today you learned from the diaries and the letters, or you learned as your mother got older? Oh, uh, it's a combination. It's a combination of uh, my little rem uh, limited memory, what she told me, and actually a year before she died, and that was before the Yom HaShoah Foundation started to record uh, survivors' uh, memories, I had a little uh, Sony camera and we sat down and we recorded. Unfortunately, that was an old fashioned Sony eight millimeter tape for which there is no recorder uh, uh, left. I donated the tape to the museum just before the pandemic started and uh, they have the capacity to convert uh, that tape into DVD or CD or electronic format. So whatever she told me two nights and I remember I couldn't replay the tape when I started volunteering to the museum because I didn't have the uh, tape player, but I had enough material for an hour or two hours to tell what I knew. But I am sure once I will be able, once this pandemic is over and I get uh, back the electronic copy, there will be other details I overlooked or I forgot. Right, right, right. Oh, that will be a very powerful tool when you can get that. So have you, so, so it sounds like your mom, someone actually, it's so funny, as you said that someone asked in the chat about have you, have you ever been recorded by Spielberg or any of these other people that are recording oral histories? Um, I have been reported, reported, <laughs> reported <laughs> <laughs> by the uh, United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. They have an archive also a very extensive archive and that's uh, only a sound recording because I was recorded uh, last summer I believe uh, before Zoom uh, was really popular so I told my story about two two and a half hours and there is a voice recording available in the museum collection. Right. Well, you'll have to do a video recording after the pandemic. Um, I don't know if people want to see my pony, but if they do, <laughs> I, uh, I will re-record re it. Actually, we have a program in the museum. It's called uh, First Person. Every year, uh, Holocaust survivors uh, tell their story. Uh, in a form of an interview. A journalist uh, talks to us and it's a one hour program and it's recorded. And the last uh, four or five years I participated. So those recordings are available. Now we are back in business almost. Right, right. This Wednesday, you can watch on the Holocaust Museum some uh, website, the first uh, first person uh, uh, presentation, which will be virtual, of course. And instead of having uh, two people every week, we will have one people every month. So uh, that will be uh, much less opportunities for us to talk, but practically most of the survivors uh, already did the first person, so those are available. Right. They, I mean, the Holocaust Museum is an amazing resource, and we're lucky to have it in, right in our community. So I hope people take advantage. I want to. Beth had a question for you. I think you want to unmute and yes, ask. Yes. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, my question is, did you experience anti-Semitism in Hungary after the war? And did you, have you, 
when you came to the United States, did you have instances of anti-Semitism that you experienced personally? Um, and if so, how did you, what was your reaction? Well, um, in Hungary, um, after the war, uh, obviously there were not much anti-Semitism. There weren't much, many Jews left to begin with, and also who were anti-Semite either were killed or were uh, executed or were taken to uh, uh, jail or camps. Uh, not, from 1949 on, during the communist era, uh, communism is against any and all religion. So religion was tolerated, but uh, discouraged, if uh, I can use that word, namely, and unfortunately, that's part of the Holocaust history. My mom coming from an ultra-Orthodox or a very Orthodox family, she gave up practicing Judaism after the war because, and she told me that she just couldn't imagine a benevolent God who let Holocaust happen. That time the word Holocaust wasn't even used. So um, she stopped lighting that we lit the Shabbat candles even at the bomb shelter, but the, after the war, we did not. I didn't get a Jewish education because although I started a Jewish uh, primary school, but in 1949, the communist government took over uh, the everything, uh, including the school system, and there was no Jewish education period. We did not belong to a synagogue. We went to the synagogue for the high holidays, not as much of practice for practicing Judaism, just because that's what Jew, Jews do. And also because the government um, so strongly discouraged uh, religion that the Hungarian version of the KGB, the secret service, were filming uh, people going in and out the synagogue and people lost their job if they were in such a position. And every job was government job, by the way. So people didn't uh, really want to, to risk their livelihood. So uh, going back to the question, no, in Hungary, I. I remember one uh, incident because um, it was very memorable. Uh, coming home from school, we didn't have school buses in Hungary and I was uh, 11 years old. I don't know what grade that is, maybe six. Anyway, a bunch of uh, us uh, who lived in the same neighborhood walking home and two guys started to fight over something, it's probably it was soccer teams because that was the most important thing that time in the 50s. And they really started to pummel each other. And one guy uh, knocked out the other one. And this guy went down to the, uh, the pavement and in desperation, uh, he said, I hate you, stinky Jew. And, I, I just remembered that I didn't have a Jewish identity. I knew that I was Jewish, but uh, the blood went into my my head and I started to pummel the guy also and he uh, hit back. So when I went home and my mom saw my bloody eyes and nose, uh, she said, uh, please stay away from uh, uh, being involved in anything like this. So that was a, a real experience and I really uh, remember there were no graffitis. Uh, I was not discriminated against me. Interestingly enough, um, I didn't say uh, that uh, in my birth certificate, my name is Grunwald and that was the name of my father. And in 1962, when I started college, my mom 
very strongly encouraged me. She couldn't uh, force me, but she very strongly encouraged me to change my name to a Hungarian sounding name because she was afraid that anti-Semitism will come back and she was a prophetess because it did come back after communism collapsed. But uh, that's when I changed my name to a Hungarian sounding name. So I don't have or didn't have very characteristic Jewish uh, face or poem, so I wasn't discriminated against, but I cannot tell that other people were not. And after communism collapsed, uh, anti-Semitism came to the surface. It was uh, latent uh, uh, during the communist era. And actually looking back, I know that I was discriminated because there were cliques uh, in elementary school, like in every school, and the cliques with hindsight was formed according to social status before the war, because after the war, everybody was equal, everybody was equally poor, but before the war, some of the parents were uh, lawyers, doctors, or, or uh, they had uh, all kind of uh, uh, titles. Uh, anyway, these kids stuck together and um, I could never join them. And uh, so there was a, a latent uh, anti-Semitism with hindsight. And now, unfortunately, uh, there is a Hungarian party in the Hungarian parliament who opened anti-Semitism. Speaking uh, 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 my experience in the United States, I personally did not have an experience. I um, know about graffiti, graffiti's uh, at local synagogues. Uh, I uh, didn't have a chance to help uh, to uh, repaint uh, the buildings because by the time I learned about it, people already fixed it. Um, what I uh, hear from the news that I, that I know and that uh, worries me very much. So specifically, um, we are talking about mostly about anti-Semitism on the right, which is very obvious and very threatening. But unfortunately, we saw in the left also, and this is uh, disturbing for me because I know that young people are just because of their age, they are on the left. Uh, and that's good, I was on the left also. But being influenced by people, um, where anti-Semitism uh, is part of the intersectionality and wokeness and uh, supporting BDS and uh, being anti-Israel or pro-Palestinian. These are the things young people are exposed to and I dearly hope that uh, they will have the kind of Jewish identity which helps them not only to preserve their Jewishness, but live it out in a way that way they will be on the side of the oppressed, of the, the bullied, and um, they will not be bystanders. Um, thank you. That was a Thank you. Uh, it's actually a beautiful way to end to talk about, you know, the message of what you're talking about is how we are not going to be bystanders and we want to help with this world. So we appreciate it's a beautiful message for all of us and we appreciate you taking the time. Um, I'm going to offer that I know I didn't get to all that like Jason I know you still had a question so if you want to stand you're welcome to but I know people we said 730 so I want to be sensitive to people's time so you're free to go and if Peter's okay with staying on a few more minutes he's available if people want to ask talk a little more. Uh, sure, I am available. 